Uh, the next slide, please. So this is the accompanying financial disclosure. And this slide should, should be available to you, uh, to all the participants and through ILSI. Uh, next slide. Uh, in the outline, I'm going to be touching upon four points. Completing the human microbial superorganism or seeding of the organism the role of self-completion in immune maturation and tolerance, second genome management, which is a very exciting new opportunity involving defeating cultivation and pruning of microbiota in different locations. And finally, the way this pertains to a new benefit-risk equation in terms of health assessment, as well as new treatment horizons. Next slide. So I needed to introduce how I got into the microbiome, which was uh, through a really strange challenge from a scientific journal that had asked me to prepare a paper in which I needed to pick the single most important biological sign that would distinguish a life filled with health from one filled with disease. And after a failed attempt to draft something, I woke up in the night from a dream with the idea that, well, it surely is self-completion. It's the idea that we're intended to be multi-species, to have a microbial majority, and the act of completing oneself is the single most important thing you could measure that would then predict health versus disease as the life uh, span plays out. So that led to, next slide, please. Um, I think I'm one, okay, sorry. That led to uh, the completed self paper and the idea that with self completion, different locations are seeded, usually host specific family sourced microbiota, particularly with natural childbirth, and that this occurring in a timely fashion because of developmental programming of physiological systems is really crucial. Next slide, please. So this was the paper that in, in a rather physics journal, and yet it happened to gain some attention. One point I want to make on the next slide, please, is that if self-completion is that critical a step, then there are ramifications for being incomplete, and that is either not properly seeded or seeded with a reduced diversity, limited diversity microbiota whether in gut, skin, oral cavity, nasal, you're a general. And that because the microbiota are, have been viewed as an integral organ, in some cases a missing organ, with potent endocrine, metabolic, uh, and uh, neuroregulatory properties, that this is really, in effect, a type of perinatal birth defect where there is not adequate seeding through whatever process. Next slide, please. So, as was mentioned, this paper in, in a physics journal of all places happened to be seen by some UK documentary film and the concept itself was included in this documentary film that came out last fall, Microbook, which fortunately won the uh, top five science festival in Prague and is happening in event next week, and it has a private screening at the Welcome Trust in the UK. If you haven't had a chance to see, um, it not only, of course, has itself idea in it, but it's in Dr. Martin Blaze at NYU, and his wonderful treatise on this micro is in the film as well. Next slide. So this was my unusual route in the microbiome, particularly relative to the and what's important to know is that there is the transfer maternal to child, uh, gut to gut, with that child or fat delivery normally occurs. And this can be shown through uh, monophylic strength height between mothers 
and newborns, and the fact that when this happens, so-called dirty birth vagina delivery process, you can track these right back to the maternal gut. But this is generally absent with cesarean. So, as a result, ensuring that there is a plan is important, regardless of uh, childbirth without. Next slide, please. The opportunity that arises with the idea of a majority microbial, 90% microbial superorganism that the baby's intended to be, is that there are only approximately 25,000 mammalian that the human has, but they're recently, through multi-country efforts, sequenced nearly 10 million microbial origin, or, or archaea as well, genes. And this is a rich target for us to essentially control, for us to understand, manipulate, nurture, treat, protect. And so this is really the new target that I'm going to be talking about, is the second genome. And this is also inherited. A baby's microbiota uh, can be tracked back to the mother and then to the grandmother as well, intergeneration. And because these genes are also interacting with the environment um, through the second genome, this becomes really important what the mammalian cells actually see in a baby. Next slide. So to drive home the import, the point that this connects us to our environment this way, particularly for the immune system, keep in mind that one of the players in our second genome are the archaea. They're not bacteria exactly. They're their own domain of life. And our archaea in our GI tract are related to the archaea Yellowstone glaciers, the archaea at the bottom of America's Trench, the archaea in the Park Lake under Antarctica, and the archaea in the Dead Sea at the Great Salt Lake. Same organism. So this really is incredible resilience, this type of organism, and we are housing them, and they are contributing when they're in balance, they're in the right place, and the right numbers, and the right diversity then we have a better chance of health. Next slide. Now, to point out that biota are incredibly active, affecting a variety of physiological systems, they are producing a variety of chemicals, short-chain fatty acids, and I'll mention those relative to the brain in a minute, but also organic compounds that can be detected in our breath and in Europe. And there are studies now showing that depending on different exposures, environmental exposures, for example, of children living uh, at a major super, uh, landfill superfund site, or individuals with different diseases with limited diversity microbiota, these can be detected. These can be detected in terms of VOCs. And practically, we're, we're going to use instrumentation for this, but next slide, please. Next slide, please. But this is already being done. This is Cliff, the Netherlands dog trained for hospital duty. And Cliff can detect C. difficile outbreaks three days before they happen in hospitals. Because Cliff can detect these VOCs and the makeup that detect the out of balance leads to C. difficile. It's given me a new appreciation. I'm sitting in the veterinary office right now, so I'm should show you the next slide, please. Just as an example, I used to yell at my dogs for this kind of behavior, and now I understand exactly what to do. And that is asking, who are you and how healthy are you? Next slide. So the metabolites from these, this mix of uh, diverse mix of microbiota contribute to a lot of different physiological effects. Now we understand the brain. So the microbiota are actually eating themselves. They're affecting craving, food preferences, and particularly where you have a dysbiosis connected to a 
or you may have obesity, and that footprint of microbiota connected to that, it's going to feed itself. So it's important to understand if you actually do something relative to health, the microbiota need to be essentially establishing a diverse, healthy-oriented microbiota that is then fed what's going to serve them the best. Uh, diet becomes a very difficult challenge for some individual where the microbiota are actually directing them in the opposite direction. Next slide, please. So relative to self-completion of the immune system, timing is very important because these co-mature together. Next slide. So if the microbiome are in place to send the proper signal, these are both soluble and cell surface factors, the gut containing 70% of the immune system. The immune system learns what's friend or foe is learned how to team with interaction with the environment and learns the environment to be friendly and we can exist in the environment without haphazard response. But on the left, it doesn't happen. The problem is the immune system doesn't know what to attempt. And that's going to wind up leading to a high risk of immunity, allergic disease, and inflammatory. Next slide. So there are a variety of immune targets affected by microbiota, particularly by dysbiosis. These involve innate immune cells, which is the variant NK cell, natural T reg, the positive, positive regulatory cells that are important as a counterbalance for inflammation and autoimmunity, dendritic cell maturation, which is really important, effective balance. It's particularly coming out of a pregnancy environment, that is TH2 skewed. And finally, macrophages and the polarization events that can so much of what goes on in terms of localized health and disease in tissue. Now, understand why the gut microbiome influence co maturing critical windows of fatal development. Next slide. So this doesn't only affect the immune cells sitting in the gut. There have been studies in rodents, as is shown here, describing that microbial dysbiosis and, and uh, candida overgrowth in the gut leads to differences in polarization of macrophages in the airways and, and an elevated risk of allergic airway inflammation. So the gut signals and the gut changes will play out in terms of other tissue responses based on other environmental exposures, and in, in this case, inhalation exposures. And it's important to recognize that this is not just a regional local effect in the gut, but, but plays out systemically. Next slide, please. So this is important in terms of not just communicable diseases and protection against those, but in particular non-communicable diseases. And this is one of my interests because NCDs are the number one killer already worldwide. They're expected to continue to increase such that by the year 2030, they're going to take half of the net globe. This is based on World Economic Forum Harvard School of Public Health studies. And at present, some almost my age is highly likely to have more than one non disease. And this is the problem is NCDs get CD. So I was making the point that NCDs are already epidemic, the number one killer globally, and they're expected to continue to increase. We're seeing that across a number of different diseases and conditions. One of, uh, next slide, please. One of the ties that binds is misregulated inflammation. And this is one of the major outcomes where microbial dysbiosis is in place during mat postnatal maturation of the immune system. This is featured in most NCDs and in a lot of the drugs that are being made and, and in uh, phase three trials now, in fact, go after trying to resolve misregulated inflammation. Because if you can do that without losing loss of function in the tissue, you have a real chance at stopping the disease. Next slide, please. These are connected by comorbid risk, um, a number of them going together. And this simply illustrates the type of timeline you can see in terms of aging. Once you start with type 1 diabetes or childhood asthma, 
uh, in uh, Kawasaki's disease or the like in infancy, that these are uh, associated with higher risk of other comorbid NCDs, um, including such things as cancer decades later in the target tissue being insulted with inappropriate inflammation. So psoriasis leading to skin cancer, some of the gastrointestinal autoimmune conditions leading to GI uh, cancers as well. And you'll see obesity and depression and conditions, again, that require pharmacological intervention um, uh, appearing as well as common um, comorbid conditions. Next slide, please. So there is already an effort, obviously, to address these diseases via the microbiome, and these involve not just the gastrointestinal system, but metabolic diseases uh, such as type 2 diabetes and respiratory diseases such as asthma. So I'm going to predict that this is going to be a major focus for not just dietary interventions, but drug therapies as well. That it's really going to be working through the microbiome and not to the exclusion of it. Next slide, please. So this introduces then the second genome management concept. Next slide, please. And there are opportunities that occur at each stage of the life course. Next slide, please. So that while the richest opportunities in terms of developmental programming occur in the pregnant woman, if she's already carrying NCDs and, and microbial dysbiosis, uh, and also then in the newborn, where clearly this is the window that if something's not been done already in an, in an adult patient, this is the time to do it uh, during pregnancy and to ensure that effective seeding occurs of the healthiest possible uh, microbiome. But any age is going to still provide opportunity for improved health. So the last topic, next slide please, is what this means in terms of protection of a healthy microbiome and in terms of treatment options. Next slide, please. So the microbiota are sitting at our portals of entry. Our exposure to the environment is occurring through inhalation, the respiratory system, the dermal system, skin, the GI system, um, again, oral exposures. So they're the front line of getting exposed. And not surprisingly, a lot of the things that we know affect mammalian toxicity affect the microbiota as well. So Actually, what happens to the mammalian cells is going to be largely dictated by what happens at that front line sentry position with the microbiota. Next slide, please. And this is shown on this uh, a figure we recently published where the microbiota basically sequester, avoid, exclude, metabolize, send specific signals, um, may undergo specific death of some species, selective expansions of other species, or may translocate. And this could be a good thing or not a good thing, depending on where they end up. And this is all affected by diet, uh, by environmental contaminants, and by drugs. And so understanding how the, these things are happening so that we can engender a healthy microbiome and protect against adverse outcomes is going to be extremely important. And this has led Dr. Ellen Silbergeld and myself, next slide please, to propose a revision of the environmental health assessment. And uh, the current one in place is shown on the top figure, and it dates back to 1987, an NRC uh, document published in Environmental Health Perspectives. And we're proposing that because this does not include the microbiome, uh, that a, a new version should be brought forward. And that's shown uh, on the bottom figure, and this paper is now in press in Toxicological Sciences. So again, the frontline position of the microbiota are really going to be determining what happens in terms of um, exposure doses for mammalian cells, regardless of what tissue, what site. And it's important to understand that interaction so that we can then better predict what actually is going to be happening in terms of uh, safety and in terms of drug efficacy. Next slide, please. So finally, the other point I'd make is that there is this vicious cycle, so to speak, that exists. And that is a whole variety of environmental conditions and factors shown on the top, from air pollution, heavy metal exposure, antibiotic use, cesarean delivery versus vaginal delivery, can affect the diversity of the gut microbiota of the infant. And altered gut microbiota and, and metabolic products um, are associated with uh, 
different disease states. So if you look at obesity, for example, and, and high body mass index as an outcome associated with restricted microbial diversity, the disease state itself also brings forward a different way to interact with the environment. So you change the microbiota, and that change is meaningful in terms of what happens when the child is exposed to arsenic, as shown on the bottom, or different iron contents and how that's being utilized, or the impact of air pollution is affected by obesity. So that you have this cycle where affecting the microbiota can help bring forward a non-communicable disease state, usually pro-inflammatory, and that this in turn, once in place, with a skewed microbiota, alters the ball game in terms of how environmental factors, drugs, and diet is handled. Next slide, please. So in terms of new horizons, you're going to have an opportunity to do a variety of assessments on microbiota, molecular fingerprinting, metabolic analysis, and the question of how to support healthy microbiota, how to protect, how to alter dysbiosis when it occurs to help bring forward uh, better treatments is going to be a, a terrific opportunity. It is going to be a golden age, I'm convinced. Next slide, please. So in summary, the human microbial superorganism is the actual target organism for dietary strategies, drug and medical therapies, health protection, safety evaluation, during pregnancy, birth, and infant perinatal programming. And effective newborn self-completion and protection begins during pregnancy and continues through the birth process in an early neonate. And it's really important to have a plan on effective mi microbial seeding. The 90% is really going to be the point of emphasis for us, again, whether we're talking about diet or whether we're talking about drug therapies. That's going to come to the forefront as our target of interest. Next slide, please. So I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Ellen Silvergeld, my co-author and co-developer uh, of this uh, new health assessment proposal, and my wife, Janice Dieter, for her co-authorship and editing. Uh, next slide, please. So if there's time, I'd be happy to try to field some questions. Great. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Great. Um, Thank you. We do have some time uh, for some questions, and I'll try to uh, moderate this the best that I can. Uh, any questions for Rodney? Very interesting uh, talk. The first part, at least I couldn't understand uh, because of transmission. What is, what is your definition of the healthy self-completed microbiome? Well, I think there's a lot of debate. I suspect the panel's discussion is going to involve that as well, because the whole question, even with fecal transplant, is what is the prototype healthy um, microbiota you want to transfer? What's very clear is that when NCDs are in place, uh, there, there is limited diversity. And it's also very clear that there are some microbiota present in the infant in different ratios than others. But I don't think we have the prototype right at the moment. What we do know is that you have a uh, diabetes, for example, asthma, um, inflammatory bowel, that uh, even under the best circumstances, that transfer is likely to be different than a vaginally delivered transfer from a woman who does not have those in. So it is an opportunity to adjust the microbiota during the pregnancy, to increase the diversity, and to put in place some of the microbes that are lost when the infant goes down the path of NCDs. So I realize I'm not giving you specific bacteria or archaea or others, but I think that we can see limited diversity is the theme with various non-communicable disease conditions. Thank you, Rodney. Rodney, I have a, a question for you. This is Mark. Um, you know, one of the challenges I, th I, I think we have in, in convincing people that overuse of antibiotics is a problem, you know, we could talk to them about antibiotic resistance of bacteria and, uh, okay. Um, 
But yet, I think for most people, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but for most people, they can take these broad-spectrum antibiotics whenever they don't feel well, the doctor prescribes them, and they don't feel any different. I know that there are instances where some people do react, but for the most part, my understanding is people do not have adverse reactions. And when we look at the colonized, the whole self that, that you talk about, why don't we see a greater impact of antibiotics, particularly these broad spectrum antibiotics. You would think for, um, for a microbiome as colonized as we are, we would see a greater impact. Can you speak to that? Yes, I actually think you, you do see an impact, uh, but I think that it's, for, uh, it's the case, uh, for example, treating C, C. difficile you, have, you need to do that. I mean, you simply do. So I'm not arguing against antibiotics. But what happens is when you do that, you then have an elevated risk in that, in that child for repeated C. difficile infections later. So there is an impact. It just takes time to play out. So what I think is going to happen and is going to be really important is to have co-therapies, where when you treat with an antibiotic, you go back in and replace what you did not want to remove in terms of the microbiome. And I think that's, they're going to be complementary therapies that you simply won't administer an antibiotic unless you're set to replace what you didn't want to kill. So I think that is going to actually help save antibiotics, make them more effective, and, and maybe reduce some of these recurrent infection scenarios that we do see. 